Hi, everybody. Good morning and welcome to another uh, YouTube on mediation for mediation and beyond. Today, I'm really happy. I've been trying to get together with Vicki Bowweiler, founder of Ki Co uh, College Financial Prep. She's a divorced mom of two children who understands the financial complexities of sending off their children to college, especially obviously being hit by the pandemic and all that that entails and how college has uh, college thoughts have uh, it's changed uh, during, uh, during the pandemic and what we see going forward. But her work with families, primarily those who are divorced, throughout the entire financial aid process starts from strategically creating a college list through financial aid form preparation, appeals, that's an interesting one, and student loan guidance, which ensures that families are able to maximize college savings and minimize costs. So I'm really happy, good morning, Vicki, to have you on here today to discuss a uh, topic that I think it feels overwhelming. <laughs> it is overwhelming to a lot of people. <laughs> oh my goodness, like just uh, married or not, just that whole college process can seem overwhelming. And then you throw into it a pandemic, right? And then you're like, where is this all going? How's it going to play out? So what have you noticed um, during, let's go to the pandemic first. What have you noticed during the pandemic about um, the college process, not only for the kids who are entering, but the kids who are coming up, like the sophomores, juniors, seniors this year, who are, you know, especially the seniors uh, coming up. What, what should parents be looking for? What should they need? To, what do they need to know? Um, something that's very important to know. So when families, and I'm using the term loosely, when families, uh, parents are looking to complete the financial aid applications, Typically, the tax returns that are being used are two years old. So for instance, say for high school seniors right now, they're going to school in fall of 21. However, they're using 2019 tax returns. Mm. So much could have happened to a family since 2019. Obviously. You know, 2020, right, the, the pandemic. So people could have lost jobs. They could have been ill and had reduced income or large medical expenses or maybe it was a separation or a divorce or, or something else impacted the family. So it's important to consider all of those things when thinking about financial aid. So why do they go back? I mean, you could be married two years ago and divorced now. Exactly, exactly. Why would they use, not that you'll know, but maybe you do know, Matt, why would you use two-year-old tax returns? So when 2019... 2019 tax returns need to be submitted to the government by April 2020, typically. I mean, in a normal year. I, this year was July, I believe, but yes, um, April 2020. So the way, the reason they do it like that is so that the tax return is, com you have a completed tax return. Because otherwise you wouldn't have the 2020 tax return for kids going to school in fall 2021. I got, oh, so it's those extension pieces that matter, right? To make sure everybody has an opportunity to get the right, check. Right. Because for the financial aid forms, the FAFSA, right? Um, you have to, you're, it's based off those tax forms, right? Right, not just FAFSA, also the CSS profile for those students that need to complete that application as well. And who need, what CSS stands for? Um, oh gosh, I always forget the terms. College, 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 college. Okay. Does it? Um, I always forget the terms. Now, who uses that versus who doesn't use that? Like, um, so FAFSA is used for every school. Okay. FAFSA is the the free application for federal student aid. So that's a government form. Okay. Um, and, and again, that's used for every every school in the country. The CSS profile is used by about, I, I want to say it's somewhere between 300 and 400 schools, mostly private. There are a couple of public ones in there, but it's, okay. it's predominantly private schools. So names that you know, typically, say um, NYU, um, all the Ivy Leagues, uh, GW, the, okay. you know, the Syracuse University, the, the big names that typically everybody knows. Um, I want to say University of Michigan. The, the, so it's important to check when, especially parents of seniors, it's important to check if the schools that the child is applying to also requires the CSS profile. You, you know, I hear this a lot, Vicki, and I don't know if you do. People will say, well, I'm not going to apply, because you don't have to apply for FAFSA. You don't have to do the, right, the free application. Because I'll hear people say, especially people coming in my office, 
doing a mediation and we're doing the college piece and they'll say, well, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna be applying for anything. I'm like, but we make too much money, right? We make too much money, you know, which is not a bad place to be in. But I always say you should apply anyways because you don't know the pool from which it is that year, right? Yes. Um Definitely everyone should apply, regardless of whether they think they make too much money or not. Um, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, one, many of the schools will award merit money only to those students that apply for financial aid. So while it sounds very counterintuitive, even if the school is, a, is awarding, you know, $1,000, $2,000 scholarships, certainly do it. Why not? You know, don't, don't miss out on the free money. Um, another reason is also regardless of income, if the family is going to be looking to take out student loans, um, and again, a family can earn, you know, $5 million, but if they're going to need student loans for whatever reason, you, have, you should always fill out the FAFSA form because the student is entitled to a loan, and granted, it's not a huge loan. For freshmen, it's $5,500, but it has the lowest interest rate. So to get that loan with the lowest interest rate, you need to complete FAFSA. And that's, so once your child enters the college of their choice, they should be doing the FAFSA form every year though, not just exactly. one, it's not like a one-off, right? You no, know. It's, it's definitely every year, especially if you need to take out those loans every year, and especially if you need to complete the FAFSA to maintain those scholarships every year. Okay, you know, like, and so let's look at kids, um, they're seniors this year. I think that's an important one. Let's look at juniors and seniors this year. So are things shifting because of COVID at all or the pandemic? Has it, has it disrupted the financial aid pieces of um, kids going to, to college or are their kids up not getting much because they're actually well, living at home? Well, okay, so there's a, there's, there's, there's a lot in there's, there. There's a few things going on there. <laughs> Um, so what ended up happening with this year's college freshmen is, yes, there, there was a turn in students going to school closer to home or staying at home. I mean, so many of the schools close their dorms and everything's online. So a, a lot of the students are at home or even if they are in the dorms, um, it's a very different experience right now. Yeah. Um, a lot of the schools, because, you know, especially even last year last spring when they shut down the dorms they they lost a lot of revenue they lost revenue from room from you know the dorms from meal plans yeah. from conferences that they typically have on campus from you know summer camps that they may run on campus so a, a lot of you know lost income for the universities and they had to start laying off some staff and you know reallocating their budgets so the colleges have been hurt which in turn it's possible to hurt the amount of money they have to award an aid. However, on the flip side, because the students aren't rushing to go to the colleges and they are staying at home and living in the dorms, they still want to entice the students to come to campus. So there were some schools that were giving, giving up very generous amounts of merit aid to entice those students to come. So, you know, it, it's going to be very school specific um, based on each school's, you know, financial situations and, and budgeting. Right. And whatnot. Um, so, yeah, there are definitely opportunities out there to be had in terms of merit aid. Um, you know, it's just a question of, you know, which schools the child is applying to and, you know, how it's all going to play out. Will, have you seen or have you heard in the pipeline that schools will be cutting their tuition rates for, let's I, say, the children for the kids coming in for the fall of uh, 2021? I don't think there's going to be, uh, I haven't heard anything. Okay. I don't believe there'll be any cutting of tuition rates. I think it's possible to give out more in merit scholarships, which is really like a discount off the price. Okay. Okay. You know, you know so like that sweater is still going to be the same regular price in the store. And they'll just put it on sale for a greater amount. Gotcha. <laughs> But you don't get the merit money if you don't file the FAFSA form. Well, it, it depends. It's very school specific. So some schools require FAFSA to award merit money. Some schools don't. Um, you know, so if there's schools that you're, you're considering that and it's a concern, you know, it's always possible to 
and just, the school just for those who don't know like what it what would what is merit money like so, so what merit, qualifies what qualify what is the merit well how is it merit based is that school specific too um well yes so typically merit scholarships are free money that's given to the student it could be for one year it could be for all four years it could be dependent on the student student maintaining a certain GPA. And if that student doesn't maintain the GPA, then the merit scholarship could be taken away. Um, so it's important to consider that if you're accepting, you know, if you're purposely saying, yes, I'm going to go to that school because of the merit award. And then all of a sudden, you know, they want a, you know, 3.2 and the child has a 3.1 and you know, then what? Yeah. Um, you know, so when students are looking for those merit scholarships, typically they want to be in the top, say 20, 25% of the applicants. Um, sometimes it's possible to find out um, through the school's website, you know, if they have certain, you know, grades or test scores or whatnot um, to be eligible for merit aid. Right. But also say the student, student um, you know, is a lead, I'm making this up, you know, French horn player or lead ballerina or, you know, a, 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 you know, lead athlete. Um, or maybe a school is in a different location from where the child is and they're looking to attract students, you know, from that other geographical location. You know, I'm in New York and I'm making this up. Maybe there's a school in the Midwest that's looking to attract New Yorkers for whatever reason. I, I you know, so they may uh, want to incentivize the child with merit scholarships to come. Um, maybe a school is offering a brand new program and, you know, here's a student that wants to participate in that program. They may be looking to, um, bring in students for that. So there's a whole host of different reasons. So if, um, and, and merit also is money that's, you don't have to pay back, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, and then if you're divorced, so if I file my tax, if my taxes were two years ago and in that two years I got divorced. How do you tell FAFSA that, you know, <laughs> you the don't. marriage didn't work out, but we still are on the hook for whatever money we need? Um, so you don't tell FAFSA that. FAFSA is going to use your tax return that is a couple of years old. Um, however, I do work, I, I mean, this is a, a huge area of the work that I do in working with separated and divorced parents. Um, I do work so that we can take the current circumstances into account it can be done and then they will look specifically at what's happening right now um you know a lot of the strategic planning that i'll do with parents um will figure out who the custodial parent is it's not always as cut and dry as who is you know in the legal document it's not as cut and dry as you know who takes the child as a dependent on a tax return. Um, you know, so I'll work with parents to figure that out. Um, and then we'll also consider their finances. You know, if there's a plan in their legal document as to who's paying for college, you know, what, 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 everybody's situation is different. Um, well, that's the other thing too. I mean, I always have people put what the college plans is, whether the child's two years old or 16 years old, right? I mean, but not everybody. No, which I don't even understand. I know my daughter was, we, she was very little when we divorced. I don't know how I had the hinds, the, the you know, the hindsight, of course, of course. Able to do that, yeah. but we, but we did, you know, we, we ended up going back, you know, 16 years later, cause she was so little when, when we divorced, but we ended up going back to court on it, but at least I had something to go back to court on where I think if people don't have anything i think they find themselves in a, a a more dire situation where they're set you're setting yourself up to argue about things so i would encourage everybody out there put college in your uh divorce agreement even though it Definitely. may not even though it may change because you can't predict where something's going to be somewhere down the road however at least you have a leg to stand on i think uh legally right definitely i i couldn't agree more with that but i do know that you know, every, every state has their own specifics when it comes to college. So it's, it's not always part of the agreement. You know, so when I work with clients and I do work with clients nationally that, um, you know, we'll always have to 
take that into account and find out if both parents are willing to help out with the, the cost of college or you know what, what the situation is. So that way we can make the best plans for how to, how to approach college. Um, are there certain schools to apply to in certain schools to stay away from? It just all varies on the, the situation. Um, right. and, some and school, go ahead. Some schools will definitely require both parents' information. Some won't. Um, even with the ones that um, you know are strictly just based on parent on one parent, you know maybe it'll be benefit both parents mm -hmm. to apply to that one school. You know it, it's just something we have to take into account. And also, what are those parents' values? You know what type of college are they looking for? You know everybody has a different opinion when it comes to college. You know, some only say, you know, my child has to go to the best school, regardless of whatever it's going to cost. Right. You know, other people, you know, want to think about their retirement, perhaps, or think about other things or, you know, so everybody's values and roles are different. And that's but, also it's one, but it's one FAFSA form per family, correct? So it's not like if I, if say, I'll just say my, I have a child as a senior, I'm not filing a FAFSA and my ex husband filing a FAFSA, right? I mean, it's just one. No, but it, could be, but it could be the CSS profile for both parents. Okay. So that's a different beast. Right. So that's, that's where I'll start to work with, you know, yeah. and, you know, so I'll help parents, you know, ideally by the time they're high school juniors, um, sometimes high school sophomores, but ideally by the time they're juniors or even like as late as the summer before senior year, you know, developing that college list, um, thinking about the financials and, you know, how is it going to impact the parents? You know, what are the academics of the student? So that way we can, you know, think about merit aid, um, you know, in, in addition to any possible need-based aid and, and develop that college list that's, you know, I want to find, I want to help the students find schools that are going to not only be a good financial fit, but, you know, the right academic and social fit too. You know, want the child to be happy. That's what we all want. <laughs> Amen for that one. So you, you, you sounds like you're recommending starting this process for those children who are decide they want to, and their families decide they want to go to college is really around the maybe end of your sophomore year or the, your sophomore junior. I mean, cause sounds like by the time you get to the fall senior year, you can't, it's kind of hard to start then a little bit. Right. I mean, it's doable. So typically I'll work with families whenever they're ready to come into the process. I mean, fall senior year is when we're doing the financial aid applications. So, you know, they, they already have a college list together. You know, whether I feel it's the best college list for them may be different than, you know, what they have. Right. So, yes, I would say recommend starting earlier. But, yeah, I'm going to help families whenever they need help. I mean, financial aid isn't just filling out a form. You know, it's a whole process. There's, there are many steps to the process and, and, and different avenues we can take to help maximize those savings. Do you also, while the child, because I know when my daughter was in college, I felt like I was a one woman show trying to find money, you know, as a single mom. And, you know, you, there's, there's a lot of money out there, right? I mean, there's a lot of scholarships to apply to. So it doesn't even have to be when you're in high school. It can also be helping still continue the process of finding money while they're in college. Oh, definitely. Well, I think um, people forget about that. Like, well, so, so even, okay, so you fill out the financial aid applications um, fall of senior year. Yep. Then say winter, spring of senior year is when I'm helping the, those parents with those changes that may have happened in 2020. But also when the student is in college, Yes, we're, we're still completing the, the financial aid forms every year, but also what if a parent um, separates when the child is in college? Absolutely. You know, there, there are steps to take um, to help those families save money. I mean, uh, I've been working with many of those families, you know, and they're thrilled when all of a sudden they're able to save an extra $10,000, you know, for the upcoming semester based on, you know, a, a recent separation. Um, you know, uh, I'm divorced. I get it you know, divorce in general costs a lot of money, whether it's, you know, attorneys, mediators, um, yeah. dividing, you know, one household into two separate residences. Sure. You know, college is the one thing where it's possible 
for both parents to realize savings. You know, so that's something that I, you know, I that, find that's a common ground. You don't hear anybody arguing about wanting to save money and cut co college costs. Right, like, right. All of a sudden, everybody's on the same page. You're like, right, well, exactly. obviously it can be done. <laughs> right? Yes, yes, definitely. I mean, you know, sometimes I'm working primarily with one parent while the other parent, you know, is there kind of with us in the background, you know, still is part of the process because the parents are working together on it. Mm -hmm. um, even though we may only be using one par one parent's information, right. it's, it, it's still, you know, it, it's all to benefit their child, to, to benefit them financially. To, you know, the, the, this is the one time where it, it's great when everybody communicates and everybody wins. And the, the grants, like the Pell Grant and those kinds of grants, do the, those all come through the financial aid form Yes, as well. So Pell grant. If you, Pell grant. if you don't apply, if you don't apply, then you wouldn't get those grants either. So it's not just merit scholarship, right? You'd miss out on the other grants as well. Right, right. So you also fill out the FAFSA for need-based aid. Yeah, and Pell grant falls under need-based aid. Like, for instance, if somebody somebody claim you know gets Medicaid insurance, okay, um, you know they'll qualify for a Pell grant for their child. So you know, typically. Um, I want to say it's about six thousand dollars a year. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's a big help. You know, whatever whatever people can qualify for, they should. It's a, it's important to fill out those financial aid applications. And do you also assist people with, uh, let's say, while their kids in college or even before they apply, but for scholarships? Like, do you help them look at what scholarships may be available to them? So I actually have a, a whole list. Well, let me say this. So there are all of these outside scholarships, private scholarships. Um, oh, there, there are so many, these scholarship yeah. search engines and databases. I have a whole listing that includes all of those, um, all the different search engines. Um, there are some music scholarships. There are scholarships for, you know, people that were affected by the 9-11 tragedy and for veterans and... Um, I want to say through Mensa and uh, anyway, I have this whole list. However, typically the colleges themselves are going to be the ones that award the most in free money. Okay. Um, not the private scholarships. Um, I don't typically help clients with the private scholarships, but I know everybody likes to look for them. Um, if if um, you know, anybody would like to go to my website, it's www.collegefinancialprep.com. Um, there's going to be a pop-up um, that asks you if you want to sign up for the newsletter. And with the newsletter, you're going to receive the, li the, the scholarship okay. listing. Okay. So, so you, can, you can receive it, and, uh, and it's not one or two. It's, it's a whole listing. <laughs> right, right. No. So, so people always love explore, exploring those. You know, when my, my daughter studied abroad in um, Morocco, and uh, one of the reasons, partly to pick it, was she studied Arabic, but the other really reason was there was more, there was more opportunity to apply for uh, money, so to speak, if you went to not like England or Italy or France. And so I learned that, and then she applied, she wrote, you had to write an essay or whatever, right. and got the whole thing paid for. Fabulous. Like, it was, it was like the Gilman scholarship or whatever, but she got, she, like, we were amazed. That's and fabulous. Like, you just don't know what's out there. You have to do some legwork, oh, but I would tell parents it's worth it. Yeah, no, there's definitely, there's, there's plenty out there. Um, you know, unfortunately, some people, they'll spend, you know, a ton of time and write a lot of essays and they may not get anything. Oh. Um, but there is some gold to be found, you know, just like you were saying. So yes, there is. And, and I mean, I didn't know what I was doing with the FAFSA. I thought it was a, you know, it, it was a lot. There are a lot of questions. There's a lot of, I don't know. There's a lot of, am I lying? Like, should I have answered differently? I don't, you know, and then there's those parents um, that don't communicate. So you could have parents that you could be a single parent and the, the child's not in touch with the other parent. You can't really you don't know what they're making. And I think right. that also is a problem because you can't force somebody that you don't
communicate with to give you their but, information. You know, typ typically with FAFSA, it's based on the custodial parent, but that's why I'll, I work with parents to, to figure that out and how to, you know. And how to what, navigate it. Right, how to navigate it. And also perhaps, you know, somebody has a student in, you know, I'll tell you a story. There's a um, financial advisor that I work with um, based in Minnesota. Um, and she has a client. The child was in ninth grade, I believe. And we were talking about, you know, who the custodial parent is and, you know, thinking about college out of time, yep. um, you know, and they almost had joint custody, you know, but to make sure it was, you know, going to play out correctly for financial aid purposes, it did make sense for, you know, one parent to say have 51% custody versus the other. So, you know, those types of things, it's important to, to consider ahead of time. So I know a lot of people are like, a, you know, 50, 50 shared parenting kind of thing. But I do think like you were saying, when it comes down to the financial aid pieces of things, you have to think of, you know, what's in the best interest of the family as a unit now that we're, right. we're not a unit, but in this case we are. <laughs> right. <laughs> you want to figure it out and what will work best. So then really you would suggest to parents start getting on this and start looking at the process. It's not just a form. I think- No, definitely not thing. just a form. And so many people think it is. Yeah. Um, but, but, there's a, but there's a lot to consider. Um, huge amount, you know, especially when dealing with separation and divorce. Um, again, to make sure that you can maximize savings. You know, my, my whole goal is to help people maximize savings, minimize those costs, reduce the need for student loan debt as much as possible. You know, the last thing I want to see is, you know, either the kids burdened or, or parents, you know, that say, oh my gosh, I'd never retire because I'm still paying off, you know, not only their own loans, but now their their children's loans. And, you know, so, yeah, you know, that's always, what I'm trying to do. There's always some monies to be found, right? I mean, right. There's always a way to kind of get a little something. Whereas if you don't even try, you know, you get nothing. Um, well, ways to get a little something. I mean, also, I hope that the parents are, what's the word that I'm looking for? You know, I work with parents. We'll, we'll actually sit down in the spring um, and I go through the child for each school, their financial aid award package. Um, nothing is standardized, but what I do is I standardize them and I will line them up next to each other, you know, and, and show them what it's going to cost, what the bottom line number is, how much they may need to take out in loans, and what that loan can potentially look like, you know, you know what it's going to cost per month and, and all of that. Um, you know, so hopefully when they have the information, you know, and we discuss it, they're able to make the best decision for them and their child. Um, you know, maybe it isn't going to the $75,000 school that didn't offer a dime. Yeah. You know, may, maybe it is choosing another school. You know, it's also important to consider what the child's um, future career intentions are. You know, if the student, well, I'll give you an example. If the student wants to be a teacher, and I'm not knocking teachers at all, but I'm just <laughs> saying, right, if, if the student wants to be a teacher and the student can go to an in-state university as compared to going to the private $75,000 school, are they going to come out with the same exact license and work in the same exact district and earn the same amount of pay? Does it make sense to pay for the $75,000 education? I mean, just, uh, you know, parents need to be informed to make the best decisions. And let me ask you this, Vicki, uh, if I'm already, in, if I already have my daughter or son in college, they finish their, their, uh, their year at the end of this year, they finish their freshman year. It's not too late to work with somebody like yourself because the next three years could be very different so if i didn't do it right or i i didn't really know what i was doing for their my child's freshman year of college oh, definitely I can, I can you you can jump in and now definitely there may be room there may be room where they were missing and that to get to get some money or, or um yes um yes definitely however um say by sophomore year the student is already in school, so we're not comparing schools and what the costs are at various right. schools unless they're considering transferring. Mm -hmm. um, but in the main, especially if there's been a change in situation, again, whether it's um, a separation or divorce situation, or if there was a 
um, yeah. but you know, unfortunately, the loss of a parent, you know, any anything that impacts the the, the family's household income, um, yes, it can definitely be addressed to help reduce costs. I mean, also, you know, it, maybe it's, it's sitting down and brainstorming where to find those extra scholarships or to discuss student loans or, you know, and finding the lowest price student loans or, you know, what, what, what can be done to help that family? You and, know, maybe, uh, maybe they just didn't fill out a FAFSA form last year, so they didn't realize any savings. Absolutely. I mean, so many people, I'll, I'll give you a for instance. Um, I just worked with a blended family. Um, so four students going to be in college this year, you Ooh. know, in the, in the combined blended family. Exactly. Um, and a financial planner recommended my services to the family um, for the two youngest who are both going to be freshmen this year. If they had come to me sooner, this family would have qualified for the Excelsior scholarship for their two older ones who are now seniors. They lost out on three years worth of right. So I can get it for them for senior year, but they lost out freshman through junior year on this scholarship. Exactly. Wow. So, right. So yes, definitely. You know, a, a consult is always worth it. You don't know what you're missing out on. And uh, can people, I can put, when I put your information in the details below for um, our YouTube, will people be able to just reach out to you at college prep? Oh yeah. Yeah. Collegefinancialprep.com. Yeah, definitely. Okay, and then they can set up and do a consult with you. Yeah, normally I always do, you know, a 15, 20 minute consult for whoever, you know, complimentary for whoever's yeah. interested. And, you know, and then we can develop a plan and see what can be done to help the family. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been really, I could go, I, there's so much to know, so much to say. Right? <laughs> but the thing about your work is, though, every family is so different. Everyone has unique circumstances. So it's not cookie cutter. No, it's definitely not, but it's, I mean, each family, it's so rewarding, yeah. you know, I, you know, each family, you know, realizes savings. I mean, even a family yesterday, and this was a married family, not divorced or anything, sure. um, you know, and they were, they were shocked by what their, it's called the EFC, um, you know, what their number came out to be that they're expected to pay for college. But we, we spoke about, you know, why their number was so high and how to reduce it for future years. You know, and so, I mean, even though it's a little late, we're still planning now. And now they'll be able to realize savings going forward. And right. And that won't be where they set themselves up to do it their senior year of college. And they could have done it two right. years, three years earlier. Right. right. So, it, it's even preventative. Right. So you're not in this loop for three years that you, or four years that you didn't need to be. Exactly. Exactly. But so strategy. It's all strategy, Definitely. right? It's really Definitely. college strategy. Um, well, thank you, Vicki. I really appreciate you coming on and I look forward to uh, being able to connect in the, in the future. And, you know, as things, uh, especially as things progress during uh, COVID, you know, and the pandemic and stuff starts to change. So we'll have to reconnect again. It <laughs> sounds great. It's been a all pleasure. Right, thank you, Vicki. You're very, very welcome. Have a great day. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.